the visible and the invisible world are in close contact. Could the veil be lifted, we would see evil angels pressing their darkness around us and working with all their power to deceive and destroy. Wicked men are surrounded, influenced, and aided by evil spirits. The man of faith and prayer has yielded his soul to divine guidance, and angels of God bring to him light and strength from heaven. No man can serve two masters. Light and darkness are no more opposites than the service of God and the service of Satan. The prophet Elijah presented the matter in the true light when he fearlessly appealed to apostate Israel, If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast of great benefit received thereby, but does this prove their course to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? What if temporal gain should be secured? Will it pay in the end to disregard the will of God? All such apparent gain will prove at last an irrecoverable loss. We cannot with impunity break down a single barrier which God has erected to guard his people from Satan's power. Our only safety is in preserving the ancient landmarks to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Chapter 26 Looking Unto Jesus Many make a serious mistake in their religious life by keeping the attention fixed upon their feelings and thus judging of their advancement or decline. Feelings are not a safe criterion. We are not to look within for evidence of our acceptance with God. We shall find there nothing but that which will discourage us. Our only hope is in looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There is everything in him to inspire with hope, with faith, and with courage. He is our righteousness, our consolation, and rejoicing. Those who look within for comfort will become weary and disappointed. A sense of our weakness and unworthiness should lead us with humility of heart to plead the atoning sacrifice of Christ. As we rely upon his merits, we shall find rest and peace and joy. He saves to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. We need to trust in Jesus daily, hourly. He has promised that as the day is, our strength shall be. By His grace we may bear all the burdens of the present and perform its duties, but many are weighed down by the anticipation of future troubles. They are constantly seeking to bring tomorrow's burdens into today. Thus a large share of all their trials are imaginary. For these Jesus has made no provision. He promises grace only for the day. He bids us not to burden ourselves with the cares and troubles of tomorrow, for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. In thus doing, we fail to enjoy the blessings and to improve the opportunities of the present. The Lord requires us to perform the duties of today and to endure its trials. We are today to watch that we offend not in word or deed. We must today praise and honor God. By the exercise of living faith today, we are to conquer the enemy. We must today seek God and be determined that we will not rest satisfied without his presence. We should watch and work and pray as though this were the last day that would be granted to us. How intensely earnest, then, would be our life! How closely would we follow Jesus in all our words and deeds! There are few who rightly appreciate or improve the precious privilege of prayer. 
we should go to Jesus and tell him all our needs. We may bring him our little cares and perplexities as well as our greater troubles. Whatever arises to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. When we feel that we need the presence of Christ at every step, Satan will have little opportunity to intrude his temptations. It is his studied effort to keep us away from our best and most sympathizing friend. We should make no one our confidant but Jesus. We can safely commune with him of all that is in our hearts. Brethren and sisters, when you assemble for social worship, believe that Jesus meets with you. Believe that he is willing to bless you. Turn the eye away from self. Look unto Jesus. Talk of his matchless love. By beholding him, you will become changed into his likeness. When you pray, be brief. Come right to the point. Do not preach the Lord a sermon in your long prayers. Ask for the bread of life as a hungry child asks bread of his earthly father. God will bestow upon us every needed blessing if we ask him in simplicity and faith. The prayers offered by ministers previous to their discourses are frequently long and inappropriate. They embrace a whole round of subjects that have no reference to the necessities of the occasion or the wants of the people. Such prayers are suitable for the closet, but should not be offered in public. The hearers become weary and long for the minister to close. Brethren, carry the people with you in your prayers. Go to your Savior in faith. Tell him what you need on that occasion. Let the soul go out after God with intense longing for the blessing needed at that time. Prayer is the most holy exercise of the soul. It should be sincere, humble, earnest. The desires of a renewed heart breathed in the presence of a holy God. When the suppliant feels that he is in the divine presence, self will be forgotten. He will have no desire to display human talent. He will not seek to please the ear of men, but to obtain the blessing which the soul craves. If we would only take the Lord at his word, what blessings might be ours? Would that there were more fervent, effectual prayer. Christ will be the helper of all who seek him in faith. Chapter 27 Calls for Laborers A spirit of worldliness and selfishness has deprived the church of many a blessing. We have no right to suppose an arbitrary withholding from the church of the divine light and power to account for its limited usefulness. The measure of success which in the past has followed well-directed effort contradicts such an idea. Success has ever been granted proportionate to the labor performed. It is the limitation of labors and sacrifices alone which has restricted the usefulness of the church. The missionary spirit is feeble. Devotion is weak. Selfishness and cupidity, covetousness and fraud exist in its members. Does not God care for these things? Can he not read the intents and purposes of the heart? Earnest, fervent, contrite prayer would open to them the windows of heaven and bring down showers of grace. A clear, steady view of the cross of Christ would counteract their worldliness and fill their souls with humility, penitence, and gratitude. They would then feel that they are not their own, but that they are the purchase of Christ's blood. A deadly spiritual malady is upon the church. Its members are wounded by Satan, but they will not look to the cross of Christ as the Israelites looked to the brazen serpent that they may live. The world has so many claims upon them that they have not time to look to the cross of Calvary long enough to see its glory or to feel its power. When they now and then catch a glimpse of the self-denial and self-dedication which the truth demands, 
it is unwelcome, and they turn their attention in another direction, that they may the sooner forget it. The Lord cannot make his people useful and efficient while they are not careful to comply with the conditions he has laid down. Great demands are everywhere made for the light which God has given to his people. But these calls are for the most part in vain. Who feels the burden of consecrating himself to God and to his work? Where are the young men who are qualifying themselves to answer these calls? Vast territories are opened before us where the light of truth has never penetrated. Whichever way we look, we see rich harvests ready to be gathered, but there are none to do the reaping. Prayers are offered for the triumph of the truth. What do your prayers mean, brethren? What kind of success do you desire? A success to suit your indolence, your selfish indulgence, a success that will sustain and support itself without any effort on your part? There must be a decided change in the church which will inconvenience those who are reclining on their lees before laborers who are fitted for their solemn work can be sent into the field. There must be an awakening, a spiritual renovation. The temperature of Christian piety must be raised, Plans must be devised and executed for the spread of truth to all nations of the earth. Satan is lulling Christ's professed followers to sleep, while souls are perishing all around them, and what excuse can they give to the Master for their negligence? The words of Christ apply to the church. Why stand ye here all the day idle? Why are you not at work in some capacity in his vineyard? Again and again he has bidden you, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. But this gracious call from heaven has been disregarded by the large majority. Is it not high time that you obey the commands of God? There is work for every individual who names the name of Christ. A voice from heaven is solemnly calling you to duty. Heed this voice and go to work at once in any place, in any capacity. Why stand ye here all the day idle? There is work for you to do, a work that demands your best energies. Every precious moment of life is related to some duty which you owe to God or to your fellow men, and yet you are idle. A great work of saving souls remains yet to be done. Every angel in glory is engaged in this work, while every demon of darkness is opposing it. Christ has demonstrated to us the great value of souls in that he came to the world with the hoarded love of eternity in his heart, offering to make man heir to all his wealth. He unveils before us the love of the Father for the guilty race and presents him as just and the justifier of him that believeth. Christ pleased not himself. He did nothing for himself. His work was in behalf of fallen man. Selfishness stood abashed in his presence. He assumed our nature that he might suffer in our stead. Selfishness, the sin of the world, has become the prevailing sin of the church. In sacrificing himself for the good of men, Christ strikes at the root of all selfishness. He withheld nothing not even his own honor and heavenly glory. He expects corresponding self-denial and sacrifice on the part of those whom he came to bless and save. Everyone is required to work to the extent of his ability. Every worldly consideration should be laid aside for the glory of God. The only desire for worldly advantages should be that we may the better advance the cause of God. Christ's interests and those of his followers should be one. But the world would judge that they are separate and distinct, 
for those who claim to be Christ pursue their own ends as eagerly and waste their substance as selfishly as non-professors. Worldly prosperity comes first. Nothing is made equal to this. The cause of Christ must wait till they gather a certain portion for themselves. They must increase their gains at all hazards. Souls must perish without a knowledge of the truth. Of what value is a soul for whom Christ died in comparison with their gains, their merchandise, their houses and lands? Souls must wait till they get prepared to do something. God calls these servers of mammon slothful and unfaithful servants, but mammon boasts of them as among his most diligent and most devoted servants. They sacrifice their Lord's goods to ease and enjoyment. Self is their idol. Doing nothing to bring souls to Jesus, who sacrificed everything to bring salvation within our reach, Selfishness is driving benevolence and the love of Christ from the church. Millions of the Lord's money are squandered in the gratification of worldly lust, while his treasury is left empty. I know not how to present this matter before you as it was presented to me. Thousands of dollars are spent every year in gratifying pride of dress. That very means should be used in our missions. I was shown families who load their tables with almost every luxury and gratify almost every desire for fine clothes. They are engaged in a prosperous business or are earning good wages, but nearly every dollar is expended upon themselves or their families. Is this imitating Christ? What burden do these feel to carefully economize and deny inclination that they may do more to advance the work of God on earth. Should Elder Andrews have the advantage of some of the means thus needlessly expended, it would be a great blessing to him and give him advantages which would prolong his life. The missionary work might be enlarged a hundredfold if there were more means to employ in carrying out larger plans but the means which God designed should be used for this very purpose is expended for articles which are thought necessary to comfort and happiness and which there might be no sin in possessing were not means so greatly needed in extending the truth. How many of you, my brethren, are seeking your own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's? Suppose Christ should abide in every heart and selfishness in all its forms should be banished from the church, what would be the result? Harmony, unity, and brotherly love would be seen as verily as in the church which Christ first established. Christian activity would be seen everywhere. The whole church would be kindled into a sacrificial flame for the glory of God, Every Christian would cast in the fruit of his self-denial to be consumed upon the altar. There would be far greater activity in devising fresh methods of usefulness and in studying how to come close to poor sinners to save them from eternal ruin. Should we dress in plain, modest apparel, without reference to the fashions? Should our tables at all times be set with simple, healthful food, avoiding all luxuries, all extravagance? Should our houses be built with becoming plainness and furnished in the same manner, it would show the sanctifying power of the truth and would have a telling influence upon unbelievers. But while we conform to the world in these matters, in some cases apparently seeking to excel worldlings in fanciful arrangement, the preaching of the truth will have but little or no effect. Who will believe the solemn truth for this time when those who already profess to believe it contradict their faith by their works? It is not God who has closed the windows of heaven to us, but it is our own conformity to the customs and practices of the world. The third angel of Revelation 14 
is represented as flying swiftly through the midst of heaven, crying, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is shown the nature of the work of the people of God. They have a message of so great importance that they are represented as flying in the presentation of it to the world. They are holding it in their hands, the bread of life for a famishing world. The love of Christ constraineth them. This is the last message. There are no more to follow. No more invitations of mercy to be given after this message shall have done its work. What a trust! What a responsibility is resting upon all to carry the words of gracious invitation, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Everyone who heareth is to say, Come, not only the ministers, but the people. All are to join in the invitation, not only by their profession, but by their character and dress. All are to have a winning influence. They are made trustees for the world, executors of the will of one who has bequeathed sacred truth to men. Would that all could feel the dignity and glory of their God-given trust. Chapter 28 The Seal of God He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary to put on garments of vengeance and pour out his wrath in judgments upon those who have not responded to the light God has given them. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Instead of being softened by the patience and long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the truth strengthen their hearts in their evil course. But there are limits even to the forbearance of God and many are exceeding these boundaries. They have overrun the limits of grace, and therefore God must interfere and vindicate his own honor. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate Creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the fourth generation. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. With unerring accuracy, the Infinite One still keeps an account with all nations. While his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. 
But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. There is no more pleading of mercy in their behalf. The prophet, looking down the ages, had this time presented before his vision. The nations of this age have been the recipients of unprecedented mercies. The choicest of heaven's blessings have been given them, but increased pride, covetousness, idolatry, contempt of God, and base ingratitude are written against them. They are fast closing up their account with God.